agencies fall underneath our purview. Um, and they, they do all their business through us. We also have statewide elected officials uh, that may do some. This conference is being recorded. Uh, Only the main conference is recorded. Um, and then with our, when we have statewide contracts, you'll find the political subdivisions, municipalities, and our quasi-state state agencies will often use those, as well as higher education institutions around the state. And then uh, you'll also see some of that with the construction facilities and uh, highways. Most of the focus today is going to be on the state agencies that fall within uh, our office, uh, but we'll also touch on statewide contracts as well. Uh, most of the business that you'll find is done uh, through one of these three methods. Uh, first is the small purchases. These are uh, classified as any purchase less than $30,000. Um, and those are governed by a small purchase executive order. So currently, um, any purchases up to $10,000 require no competition. Most of those will be paid for using uh, a procurement credit card. For purchases between $10,000 and $20,000, those are going to require three quotes, um, or we can go with a Hudson or veteran certified business. Um, most of those will be through fax bids. And then between $20,000 and $30,000, five quotes are required, or you can solicit from a certified business as well. Um, again, those you'll see some of those come out as fax bids, but as they get closer to the $30,000 number, uh, they will be solicited through a competitive sealed bid. Uh, which is our next option here. Uh, we'll also refer to competitive sealed bids as ITBs. Uh, it's an invitation to bid. Uh, and these are low dollar bids. Uh, so the business is given to the vendor that is meeting our specifications and has the lowest cost. These bids are uh, publicly advertised. They'll be in a newspaper as well as on the LAPAC website. Our third competitive um, procurement method is the request for proposals. Uh, these are longer and more complex um, solicitations. And here we're looking at um, factors other than price as well as price. Uh, so this will be your, your technical uh, solution as well. Um, oftentimes this uh, request for proposals allows a vendor to, to provide quality in addition to just lowest cost. Uh, when it comes to requests for proposals, often because they are complex, uh, this is an opportunity to also be a subcontractor in addition to, to the uh, proposer. Uh, in addition to the competitive uh, methods that we just went through, uh, we have some non-competitive as well. And what this means is that an agency can just directly contract with uh, a vendor instead of having to post a bid. The main area that, that those will occur is in our uh, PPCS service contracting. So it's going to be professional services, uh, which are things like doctors, lawyers, engineers, architects, actuaries, accountants. Um, those are non-competitive regardless of price. Uh, personal services are also non-competitive regardless of price. And these are going to be um, more things like artists and photographers, uh, generally artwork, or things that are providing unique talent specific to a person um, underneath personal services. Uh, for consulting services, <clears throat> these are non-competitive for uh, contracts less than $75,000 per year. 
Uh, and social services are also non-competitive for less than $250,000 per year. Uh, those last two categories, and particularly consulting services, are where the majority of service contracts um, lie with the state. <clears throat> uh, there are also opportunities where we get business through cooperative purchasing. These are uh, generally through large nat national cooperatives, uh, which are just a, a group of um, government agencies uh, combining their purchasing power to establish large contracts. Um, for the state of Louisiana, most of our cooperative contracts are with Nat are through NASPO Value Point, um, so that may be an opportunity as well. And we also have brand name contracting, which uh, when that's opened up as a category, uh, it's particular to a brand name and we'll have a contract with that so the vendors are competing um, at the distributor level rather than manufacturer level. And then finally, we also have uh, various emergency procurement methods. So we'll get into statewide contracts. Uh, you may hear these referred to as a 44 contract. Uh, you also may have uh, agencies asking you if you have a state contract. Uh, so the statewide contracts are contracts that are set up by the Office of State Procurement and they're available to, uh, generally available to all um, government purchasers in the state, whether it's state agencies, uh, municipalities, parishes, school boards, universities, uh, community colleges, um, they'll all purchase from these statewide contracts. We typically uh, get a statewide contract established through an ITB, so a low bid. Um, but occasionally we have a few that do go through RFP, um, and increasingly we're combining our purchasing power with other states to, to establish cooperative contracts and go that method. <clears throat> Mentioned uh, emergency purchasing on the previous slide. Uh, we will also have some statewide contracts that are emergency contingency contracts, uh, and those are contracts we set up for emergency services and our goods uh, that may be needed in case of a hurricane, for instance. When it comes to emergency procurements, you'll have two types of emergencies. Now, the most common is the usual emergency. Uh, and this is a more localized emergency, usually happening to a specific building or a specific agency. Um, for example, a water line bursts at a prison, and the agency needs to quickly get that fixed. Um, <clears throat> in that case, uh, well, we'll go through actually. The second type is going to be the catastrophic emergencies. These are governor declared emergencies, um, such as a hurricane. Uh, freeze events, um, and a few years ago, a cybersecurity incident as well uh, was a catastrophic emergency. Um, with both types of emergency, we follow kind of the same procedures, and that is we the uh, procurement rules and statutes are kind of relaxed. We need to react quickly, uh, so we're going to find business where possible by getting three quotes. Um, that's not always possible, but the, the idea when it comes to emergency, so if an agency reaches out to you and says it's an emergency, uh, we're looking more at speed than uh, lowest cost. Okay. Um, so generally that's going to be three quotes, um, depending on time frame. For instance, uh, during COVID, we did a lot of requests for quotations. Um, generally, those are going to be posted to a PAC as an RFQ. Um, and then we'll also use our statewide contracts and our emergency contingency contracts as, as we uh, see a need. Okay, we have a few questions. How does the company get on the statewide contract? Okay. 
Uh, so statewide contracts, as I mentioned, most of those are going to be done through an invitation to bid. Um, so to get a statewide contract, uh, you find a, a bid that uh, is for a service or goods that you provide, uh, and you offer the lowest price uh, to win the, co the state contract. Uh, for other methods, if, if you have a cooperative contract already set up, uh, you can get that adopted by the state by finding three uh, agencies that indicate uh, will provide you with a letter stating that they will uh, use your contract if you had one. Um, so those are going to be your two main methods. Uh, for those few state contracts that we do through an RFP, it would be similar to an ITB uh, respond to the RFP. Uh, and have the most advantageous proposal, uh, and you'll receive the contract. Okay. Is there a list that we can get on for the state's professional services so that we are aware of them? Okay. <laughs> um, so for, for most of those, um, agencies will find, uh, we'll look at our registered vendors, so we'll get into a little bit um, as to how to register. But for most of the non-competitive procurements, um, it's going to be very similar to how you do business with, without, or to non-government entities, and it's just going to be, you know, knocking on doors, making phone calls, uh, finding out who is the person at the agency that is the, the ultimate purchaser there, um, and convincing them that that they should have that contract with you or that they should go through you. Uh, to provide the service or goods that they need. Does non-competitive mean that the selection criteria is beyond price point? Kind of. Um, non-competitive really means uh, that we're not doing a formal competitive procedure. Uh, this formal being uh, the invitation to bid or the RFP or uh, and a fax bid in the case of small purchases. Um, <clears throat> that doesn't mean that agencies aren't also using competition, for instance. If they needed to find an attorney, they may be comparing prices or getting quotes from different people as well. They're just not required to. <clears throat> and then they're also not required to, if they do the quotes, they're not required to go with the lowest one. I think he answered this, but how do you suggest a particular product or category for state contract, and what are the parameters for selection? Yes, if, if you have a service, I kind of mentioned part of this already, but if you have a good or service that you, you don't believe is on state contract that may benefit multiple agencies, you would follow a similar procedure to uh, what I laid out for the cooperatives. Find some agencies. Uh, to provide you a letter stating that if you had a contract or that if there was a contract for that good or service, um, they would use it and then uh, turn those into the Office of State Procurement. Uh, we have some information on how to do that on our website. <clears throat> and then uh, we would look at it and determine if it makes uh, sense to have a statewide contract for that good or service. There are a lot more questions, but I would say go ahead and we'll get back to the questions yep. in a minute. Yep. We'll get to some more in just a little bit. All right. So uh, we have a few state systems uh, that we use. Uh, your main point of where you can find information is going to be on our website. Uh, there's an easy link to bring you there. It's procurement.la.gov. Uh, that will bring you to our homepage. <clears throat> where we have uh, some tiles, a vendor tile that provides all the information you need, may need as a vendor. Uh, there's also information out there for state agencies that you can look at if you, if you want to have an idea of what uh, guidance they're being provided as well. Uh, your main uh, system that you'll be using is going to be LaGov. Um, we tie in LaPAC there. They're very closely integrated. <clears throat> and this is going to be where you uh, register as a vendor. Um, LAPAC will also have the postings of the bids and RFPs. 
Um, it will give you uh, electronic notifications if you're registered. Uh, when something is posted that you've indicated you may be interested in. Uh, you can also look at a list of all registered vendors. Um, you can look at a list of all of the commodity codes that we use. Um, it's just a large resource uh, for you as vendors. Um, ECAT is going to be the uh, where you can look up all of our existing statewide contracts. So if you're interested in seeing, maybe you're a distributor for a particular company and you're, you're not sure if they have a statewide contract, you can go there, find out if they have one, uh, and then um, reach out to the buyer that's listed for that contract to let you or to see the process for becoming a distributor. And you can also see there if there's any uh, contracts that are maybe similar to uh, services that you provide. Um, and try to find out when they'll be coming out for bid next or how the state is establishing that contract just so that you have the information so that you can potentially compete for it the next time it'll go out. Uh, and the, the last system we use uh, is a, our newest system uh, called LISA. Uh, and this is a, an e-procurement system that we're using to uh, issue our RFPs. Um, so notification of those will still occur in LAPAC, um, but you can respond electronically to the RFP through the LISA system. And we have links um, on the uh, LAPAC notice that'll bring you uh, to where you need to be to see those RFPs. Right, so here's a screenshot of our website. Uh, you can see vendor resources. It's going to be your uh, main source uh, for resources that you may use. When you click there, you'll see uh, some frequently asked questions uh, split by category at the very top. <clears throat> you also see on the left side, uh, we have an overview of our office as well as a staff directory. Um, that'll also show you a listing of our buyers and what commodities they cover so that you can find which one you fit in and you'll have the contact directly to the buyer. Towards the bottom of that screen on the left side we've got vendor registration information along with some help scripts on how to register. It's a fairly easy process um, and it's a self-registration. It's free. Um, so definitely, if you're interested in doing business, that's going to be the first place you should go. Um, also, links here, we have uh, links to LAPAC in the middle column uh, at the very top. Um, you also have uh, some external links bringing you to federal business opportunities, um, our Procurement Technical Assistance Center, uh, as well as uh, DOTD if you're interested in uh, more construction type work. All right, we have a link to our vendor training, and then we also have um, some other potentially helpful uh, links right below that, listing our state agencies, uh, as well as all of the uh, political subdivisions, municipalities, and quasi-state agencies uh, that are authorized to use our statewide contracts. Right. On LAPAC, uh, this is a screenshot of the LAPAC homepage. <clears throat> and you'll see most of this is geared towards various ways to search or browse through um, bids that are posted. Um, although the, the far right tab will also have a registration menu for you. Uh, so you can either uh, start that registration from our website or from LAPAC if you're already there. Uh, so this link will also bring you to that. Uh, you can see here the vendor registration menu. These are going to be a lot of the same links that we saw on the OSP page as well. Clicking vendor enrollment portal will bring you into the LaGov system um, and that's where you are registering. I kind of touched on some of these, but 
<clears throat> lots of benefits of registration. Um, you get the automatic notifications. Um, when you register, you're choosing the commodity codes uh, that match the goods or services you provide. When a um, bid is posted that matches that commodity code, uh, the system will shoot out an email to you letting you know that it's posted. Um, to mention, enrollment is free. Uh, it is fast. It's not a very cumbersome process. Uh, and it is available 24-7 because it is self-enrollment. Um, you can also have self-account maintenance as well. We got into this in one of the questions about the, uh, the non-competitive contracts. Um, being registered, often agencies will go look at our registered vendor list um, when they're trying to find vendors that they can, they can do business with non-competitively. Also has one uh, benefit as well. <clears throat> you can also do online bids if you're registered instead of submitting paper. And um, ultimately, if you do win business with the state, you're going to need to be registered anyway, so you might as well do it up front. Uh, this is just a closer screen on the registration help scripts. Uh, these help scripts will walk you through each stage of registration. And then once you're registered, there's also help scripts that uh, go through how to uh, set up your account. <clears throat> so now looking at uh, LAPAC, one of the links on the homepage was bids by department. Clicking there will bring up a list of all of the entities that use LAPAC to post their bids. Um, agencies that currently have a bid posted are going to have a hyperlink. You see that here in blue with an underline. Uh, the ones that are just bold uh, and have a zero in parentheses, what that indicates is that they do not currently have a, a bid posted. Very top here, you'll see state procurement. That's where all of the bids that state procurement issues will go. Um, it will usually, and I'll say always, will be the most bids will be uh, within that one department. Um, because of that, it may take a little bit of time for that to load. So give it a few seconds uh, after you click. Um, it will eventually pop up with, uh, when the screenshot was done, for instance, the 214 bids that we had posted. <clears throat> so see here, uh, you'll see for some of the agencies, for instance, state-corrections. Um, in addition to state agencies that use LAPAC, there are also several municipalities and universities that also use LAPAC. Uh, so that's another benefit to registering is that you get notified of their opportunities as well when they post to LAPAC. Uh, if you'd rather look um, or browse bids by category instead of by uh, agency. You can click LAPAC bids by category. Uh, and these are by the commodity codes. We use the UNSPSC uh, commodity codes. Uh, it just breaks down uh, all of the purchases into their various goods and services. Whichever method you choose to browse, uh, you'll end up on a screen similar to this. This is showing all of the state procurement uh, bids that were at this time. Uh, and looks like 2019 when the screenshot was taken. <clears throat> but this is what it'll look like, and then you can browse through it all the opportunities. Um, you can also do a search when you're on this page. Let's see by using Control F in your browser uh, to search for uh, maybe the commodity that, that was posted. <clears throat> so for each bid, uh, you'll see some links. Once the original bid, uh, make sure you also read the attachments as well, because uh, that's where most of the information is going to be found. Uh, if you're interested in bid, make sure you are, you're keeping up with it, because we may post addenda as well uh, that can either change specifications or due dates or provide answers to questions that vendors submitted. Right. <clears throat> uh, so 
now that you've you've registered as a vendor and maybe you're wondering why you're not getting much business and that's because uh, you need to go out and you know knock on doors <laughs> so uh, here are some strategies that you can have for success uh, at this point uh, as I mentioned earlier uh, treat the state just like any uh, regular business that you would be uh, you know, trying to do business with. So when you go in, offer a solution, uh, maybe find out what that agency's problems may be, come up with a solution to them, uh, and if they can non-competitively uh, do business with you, they, they may decide to do that. If not, um, you know, you'll at least at that point they'll be aware of you. So when they do post a bid or an RFP, uh, they'll make sure that you're notified of it. Uh, so I mentioned before, uh, registration is important. Um, don't be afraid of competition. Um, you know, even if you're not the lowest bid on your first few, uh, you may learn some things and be able to come in uh, at a lower price point later. And above all, just market your services. Find out who those decision makers are uh, and market your services. I always touched on this a few times, but the low hanging fruit is going to be those non competitive purchases and contracts. Uh, that's going to be those items less than uh, $10,000 or um, consulting, professional, personal, or social services. Um, if you're a small business, <clears throat> definitely look into the uh, Louisiana Department of Economic Development Hudson Initiative Program um, that will provide you additional opportunities as well. Um, along with that, if you're a veteran-owned business, uh, there's also a, a certification for those as well. Um, so those are going to give you uh, essentially increase the amount of low-hanging fruit that you may have. So. Uh, if you're a certified Hudson Initiative company, you get a little bit higher of a bump on the non-competitive uh, threshold. And then also, uh, you'll receive additional points on an RFP uh, if you're either the uh, prime or a subcontractor. And then another way to do business, and it kind of ties into subcontractors as well, Partnering with other vendors is also a great way uh, to get your foot in the door. <clears throat> For our resources, we touched on some of those on our website. Uh, we also have a fairly comprehensive uh, vendor guide uh, that's posted there as well. Uh, it's a, a large PDF that goes through uh, a lot of what we've discussed today as well as a lot deeper dive into our registration procedures, bidding, contracting, um, and how we provide customer service to the vendor community. All right, so now we will uh, get to a lot of the questions. I think a lot of them have stacked up. We got a lot of questions. Um, a lot of them are repetitive, so I'm trying to go through and make sure that I don't repeat them all. Uh, a lot of people had questions about, is the lowest bid the only way to win business through the state? Um, no, it, it's not the only way, but that is with the caveat of that most of our uh, competitive solicitations are done through the low bid process. Um, but also, uh, important part of that that may sometimes be overlooked, uh, it's the lowest bid that's meeting our specifications and it's also coming from what we determine to be a responsible uh, vendor. Um, responsibility being that uh, essentially that we believe you can do the work. Uh, so that'll be several things we look at, um, such as the resources your company may have um, at their disposal. Uh, it's not a, a giant hurdle on responsibility. Uh, just to say that just because you have the low bid doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to win that uh, invitation to bid. Okay, we also had a few questions about out-of-state companies being able to 
do business? Do they only need to be registered? And also, are Louisiana companies given preference? Okay. Um, so yes, uh, out-of-state companies, um, we do business with out-of-state companies, so you would, you would just need to be registered. Um, whether there's a preference really depends on uh, the solicitation. Um, but in most cases, there there's not a, a preference. Well, I shouldn't say it. In most cases, there's not a preference that is applied. Uh, we do have some statutory preferences that go in for Louisiana registered businesses. Um, but for most of our um, business that we do, they don't they don't affect the outcome. Do you to buy American Act products? You repeat that one again. <laughs> oh, I just lost it. Um, do you have requirements linked to buy American Act products? Okay. Uh, that is going to depend on the specific solicitation. Um, I know there's a, a lot more uh, guidance that's come out from the federal government as far as uh, the Buy America Act requirements. Um, so that, those will be clearly listed if it is a Buy America required um, good in the solicitation document. Okay, we had several questions about co-ops. Um, do you allow co-ops in addition, let's see, in addition to NASPO, do you allow SourceWell, NCPA, TIPS, AEPA, et cetera? Yes, we have, we have additional uh, co-ops that we use. Um, <clears throat> it's just the uh, main co-op that we use is NASPA Value Point, um, followed by SourceWell and Omnia Partners, um, but we do have a few contracts with other uh, cooperatives as well. Okay, what are some examples of non-competitive services? Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, for regardless of value, you're going to be looking at uh, the professional contracts as well as the personal contracts. On um, professional, a good guideline there is going to be it's a profession that, that requires uh, some certification. Um, those are specifically listed in statute, but that's a good, a good guide to go with. Uh, and those are things like your accountants, your CPAs, uh, doctors, lawyers, um, actuaries fall within that as well. Uh, personal services, uh, good rule of thumb, is it something that only that specific person can provide? So that's where you find like artists, there, you know, only the specific artist can make a painting by that artist. Uh, so those are things like artists, sculptors, musicians, um, but there, there are a few as well. Uh, so you can check on our website. We have links to uh, legal information as well as our rules and regulations, and that's going to provide you the full list of uh, what's considered personal and what's considered professional. Um, <clears throat> we'll say there's a very few, particularly personal services. Um, professional is going to be mainly, you know, attorneys contracts, but there are some in the others as well. <clears throat> so most of your non-competitive contracts are going to be consulting uh, contracts less than $75,000 per year. Um, so that's going to be the main, the main non-competitive services. Okay. What's the difference between brand name and statewide? Uh, brand name is a subset of a statewide contract. Uh, so <clears throat> um, most of our statewide contracts, uh, we're going to provide you a specification list detailing you know, general requirements that we, we need. <clears throat> uh, and they're going to be open to any brand. We're not brand specific for most of them. Uh, when it comes to brand name contract, we're going to specifically list, uh, for instance, uh, we're going to say it, it has to be a John Deere tractor. Um, and then we're competing it based on uh, who can provide that specific brand name. OK, 
okay with category bids is only one vendor awarded per contract? It depends on uh, the solicitation and the contract. Um, many of our statewide contracts are single award, um, but we do have uh, several that are multiple award. We'll also say when we open something up as uh, to the possibility of a cooperative contract, um, those are multiple awards as well. Uh, <clears throat> okay, a lot of manufacturers are in the same boat with supply chain situations. State contracts typically are still requiring 30, 60, or maybe 90 days to deliver. Currently, that is not realistic in most cases. What is your delivery time frame, and is there a 12-month guarantee on pricing, or do you allow for pricing adjustments? All right, so we'll start with the, the requirements. Most of our bids will have uh, an area where the vendor is providing with their bid the delivery time frame after receipt of order. Um, <clears throat> so that, that would be coming from the vendor community. Uh, there are a few bids out there though where we do, where we have a set schedule when we need the goods or the services. Um, those will clearly list, you know, the delivery time frame here must be 60 days to use something. Um, <clears throat> uh, so that, that's there. Um, traditionally, most of our contracts have been a uh, fixed price for the term of the contract. Um, with the supply chain challenges, uh, more and more we're inserting uh, flexible pricing, uh, which will allow updates on a, a regular basis. Um, most of those are gonna be every uh, once a year when it comes time to renew the contract, uh, you can request a price increase and, and we'll look into uh, the justification behind it. Um, but depending on the commodity, that may be sooner. Um, some, you know, we'll look at uh, every month or every three months uh, to potentially adjust the pricing. Uh, we're aware of a lot of the challenges going on right now and uh, doing our best to adapt while still following um, our rules and regulations and our statutes. Uh, and as well as maintaining uh, our ability to be good stewards of the public funding. Okay, Lamas versus NASPO. Who determines which is going to be used on a bid? Uh, so uh, Lamas contract is uh, it's very similar to a cooperative contract. Um, it, except for instead of going through a cooperative, the underlying contract is a, a federal GSA contract. Um, so very similar there uh, with an additional requirement that a, a Louisiana distributor uh, has to be uh, tied to that contract for LAMAS. Um, neither one of those are bid out by the state of Louisiana unless we happen to be the lead state on the cooperative contract. <clears throat> but what we're looking there is um, if you have one of those, if you have a GSA contract or if you have a uh, cooperative contract that hasn't yet been adopted in the state and you believe uh, would be beneficial, uh, this is where those three letters come into play. You get the three letters from three agencies stating that if you had a contract, uh, that they would use it along with the dollar amount uh, submit those to the Office of State Procurement, and um, we'll review to see. Uh, and this, you may have heard me mention um, opening up the category. Uh, if we already have cooperatives, the category's already been opened, so we're more um, receptive to adding additional contracts uh, in there. If instead it's something where we have not yet done a, a LAMAS or a cooperative contract for that a particular good or service, um, it's a little, usually a little bit higher of a hurdle. Uh, we just need to do more research to see if it's in uh, our best interest to, to go that cooperative route or to uh, continue bidding it out the way that, that we traditionally have. Okay, is there a format that you want agencies to use when writing regarding their business or state contracts? Uh, no, we don't have a particular format. Uh, and it's usually a, a one-page letter just stating that uh, what 
good or service they would use from your contract and the anticipated annual spend that they would uh, that they would have with you. If we were on a co-op contract and have three agencies that purchase from us, what is the next step? Uh, next step would be three, if you don't have a contract already, would be uh, to get those three letters and submit them to uh, state procurement. Okay, since we are owned by a company that is already on a brand name contract, can our equipment that we manufacture and equipment that we manufacture with their name on it be added to their contract? I'm trying to answer the question without saying it depends. Um, that would be that would be a situation where you would want to contact uh, the buyer for that contract to get into more details because that, that's a question that's very detail uh, dependent. Uh, so it'd be difficult to answer kind of generically through this format. Um, are healthcare related services procured in the same manner? Uh, they, they'll fall under one of the uh, methods that we, we showed earlier. Um, you know, some of those will fall within the, the definition of the social services contracts, uh, and those are non-competitive at uh, less than $250,000 per year. Um, but there are uh, several um, healthcare, healthcare adjacent uh, services that that are going to be done through a competitive process. Um, usually if it's a service that's going to be done through an RFP of some sort, um, but we do have some that we have done as an invitation to bid. For instance, we I know we lined up um, some nursing staff augmentation through uh, an invitation to bid. Um, how do you find the previous price of a bid? Uh, public records request uh, is generally going to be um, just about everything we do uh, with the state is public record. Um, so that includes um, previous proposals to an RFP, um, all of the bids on past bids. So um, there are some things that are going to require formal public records requests uh, to uh, Division of Administration. We have links on our website as well, but it's DOA public records at la.gov. Um, some of them you can just go straight to our office <clears throat> and ask for it. Uh, those are going to be things like the bid tabulations. Um, we can provide those without going through uh, the, the formal public records process. Okay. Do you purchase services through group purchasing organizations or coalitions? And it depends. I mean, there there are a few. <laughs> it's hard to say. Uh, it's very specific on the individual situation. If there is an RFI posted, do you have to respond to that RFI to be eligible for the RFP released later on? <clears throat> In, in most cases, no, but there may be certain RFIs that will state in them that it's going to require uh, you to respond to that RFI. Uh, but again, that's, that's not a normal practice to do it that way. But <clears throat> if that were the case, it would be very prominent within the RFI. I don't, this one's not for us. Once we are awarded a contract, is there a way that we can check the status of payments? Um, I would have to check with the, with our LaGov team <laughs> on that. There, there may be a way through your vendor registration uh, to check on any outstanding invoices, but I, uh, it's not really within uh, Office of State Procurement's purview. Okay. 
Okay. Um, I'm in the financial service industry and would like to visit office and offer services to unclassified state workers. Is there a process for doing that? Um, possibly, <laughs> it's probably you're probably going to want to get with uh, an agency's uh, human resources department uh, for things like that. Uh, they they usually handle um, services available to individual employees. Um, there's a few questions about how to find certain buyers okay. on commodities. Yeah. Uh, so on our website, we, we had the uh, left side had contact information. Uh, that's going to have a listing of all of our uh, commodities buyers along with the commodities that they're responsible for. Um, if you don't find what you're looking for there, uh, on this slide we have now, the uh, help desk purchasing uh, is a, a way that you can find that as well. Just send an email to that uh, in email address and uh, they'll forward it to the correct buyer. Um, okay, are National Minority Council certifications valid? And does the state of Louisiana give preference to vendors with minority certifications? So, as far as if they're valid, um, that would that would be, I guess, with the certifying entity as to whether they're valid. Uh, do we give preference in Louisiana? Uh, no. Um, the only the preferences in Louisiana, uh, the main preferences, I should say, because we we have a lot in statute, um, but they're going to be uh, generally all of them are with Louisiana registered businesses. Um, as well as uh, the aforementioned Hudson Initiative and Veteran Owned Business Initiative. Okay. Does the Department of Education work under the same umbrella where learning materials are involved? Uh, Department of Education does have some autonomy when it comes to some of the learning materials as well as um, where they're going as to whether they come through a state procurement. Um, so that would be, uh, you know, it's another answer would depend on the specific situation. Are there any BAA requirements from the state of Louisiana when using state funds or only federal? So, Generally, we refer to the, the acronym BAA as a business associate addendum, and where we'll see those is usually on contracts that um, have um, personally identifiable information, whether it's medical or taxpayer records or things like that. Um, he clarified with Buy American Act. Okay, Buy American Act. <laughs> okay. Um, it, it depends on the, the commodity. For instance, uh, we we do have a state law that vehicles that we purchase must be produced in the United States. Uh, we have a rule that clarifies what produced in the United States means. Um, but most of the, the Buy America Act is going to come from uh, federal, there's going to be attached to federal funding that we may be receiving. So in regards to getting a state contract and the accompanying letters, who is the point of contact for that? Uh, you can either find the buyer through our website or send uh, an email to the uh, purchasing help desk. Okay. In regards to guaranteed energy performance contracts, there's a section on your website for this with model RFPs available. My question is, do K through 12 and municipalities have to use this model RFP or is this only for state agencies? Good question. <laughs> 
Good question. Good question. Yes. Um, we, this will be one uh, that please send that to the help desk and, and we'll find an answer for you on that. Um, how do you partner with another vendor without being labeled as a pass-through? And then they asked again how, I guess, how to contract legally. Okay. Um, assuming this is maybe for, we're talking about for capturing points is maybe a Hudson certified vendor. Um, when we're looking for those, uh, we're looking at the subcontractor providing value in it as well. Um, so that'll be, that's one of the things if, if it's, uh, if it's not showing that the subcontractor is providing any value under the contract then points aren't awarded. Does anybody else have any questions? We don't have anything else in the Q&A. I've typed it a few times, but we will be posting the PowerPoint and the recording to the website likely before the end of this week. See the one that just popped up? Yes. Uh, okay, so would you be looked upon favorably for contracts if you are a certified DBE through the state of Louisiana DOTD agency? Um, I'm not familiar with the DOTD laws and regulations when it comes to uh, construction projects. Um, so that, that would need to be a question directed to DOTD. Uh, the link for the presentation is going to be procurement.la.gov, and it's going to be in our training resources. It hasn't been posted to the website yet. It will be there before the end of the week. Are healthcare related services procured in the same manner? Pharmacy services, mental health, EAP. Um, the three you listed are not are often not procured in the same manner um, and, and it depends heavily on the agency that's procuring them as well. Uh, many pharmacy services and mental health services are going to be uh, fall under, under uh, professional contracts which are non-competitive um, but there are also some services out there that are done through an RFP for those so uh, it's really really depends on what that agency is trying to accomplish. you offer a unique technology software slash service to the state that only your organization can offer would that fall under the $75,000 non-competitive contracts? Um, $75,000 non-competitive is for consulting. Um, so that would be, uh, it's generally not going to be a software. It's going to be like a custom build software, uh, which doesn't sound like this question is, is indicating. Um, so those would fall uh, within our, our IT rules. Um, we we also, I guess, wasn't heavily mentioned, but uh, another way we do business is through what's called a sole source, uh, and there are there are additional rules in place uh, for if something's being claimed as a sole source. Uh, we have uh, information on our website that that describes that as well. For staffing agencies, what code can be used because it's not on the vendor site? Um, this would be one, you can reach out to the buyer. Um, you can also look up uh, through ECAT uh, we have some various staffing contracts in place, and ECAT will show will tell you which uh, commodity code was used for those. Uh, it's it's probably different depending on which kind of staffing 
uh, you're providing, whether it's going to be IT or more uh, traditional clerical staffing work. You award many contracts through a small purchase executive order. Uh, yes. <laughs> so uh, that kind of falls under the, the Pareto principle. Um, roughly 80% of the uh, spend on operating services uh, is done through the small purchase executive order. Nursing, uh, for nursing staffing, you may want to look under, uh, try to look up nursing to find that. It may not be listed specifically as nursing staffing, um, but that would be the best way to look for it. Or, uh, again, reach, find uh, our buyer who handles that service. All right, well, we're at uh, time now. So uh, thank you for attending today. Our uh, contact information is listed here. If you have any additional questions, please uh, utilize one of the help desks uh, or you know, give us a call. Uh, again, everybody have a, a great day.